the election of Trump probably would be a big uh, topic of discussion uh, at COP29 because that's certainly going to affect the uh, you know the direction in which uh, the climate discussions will happen from here on hello viewers of the indian express i am flora swai and we are here today to discuss cop 29 which is scheduled to be held in baku azerbaijan and to discuss cop 29 its main agenda and it what it has in store for climate protection strategies all over the world we have with us today amitabh sinha the deputy editor of the indian express who writes predominantly on environment and climate change apart from water, space, science and technology and nuclear affairs. Um, Amitabh, first off, we would delve into COP29, but first off, because we are 48 hours after the US elections, what does Trump mean for climate change? We know he's a staunch denier of climate change. He considers oil as liquid gold. How do you see Trump as the 47th President of the United States? He has uh, earlier pulled out of Paris ag Agreement. You think he's going to pull out again? And what is the impact of his election now? Right, so we are not sure whether he'll again pull out of Paris Agreement, though he can. Uh, and the thing is, he, uh, in his manifesto, or at least on his campaign site, uh, there is a mention of the fact that they would like to pull out of Paris Agreement once again. So, although on the campaign side, he has promised to take the United States out of Paris Agreement once again. Right. But there is one marked difference from uh, 2016 uh, and now. In his first presidential campaign, he was talking about Paris Agreement, uh, how unjust Paris Agreement was to the United States. And he had explicitly been promising that he would take the United States out of Paris Agreement. This time, he's slightly mellowed. He's not been talking about it that frequently, right. uh, uh, even though, as I said, it's there in his promise. But yes, the election of Trump probably would be a big uh, topic of discussion uh, at COP29 because that's certainly going to affect the, uh, you know, the direction in which uh, the climate discussions will happen from here on. So it, it's it's a big point of discussion at COP29 probably, you know, it will dominate the discussions at least in the first few days of the two-week conference. Absolutely. Uh, now, each COP uh, chapter of this UN Climate Summit, it has its own set of goals and agendas and right. it also, uh, COP29 with, uh, will also build up on the previous year's uh, summit. What are the key focus areas, uh, what do you think will be on the agenda this year? So this COP is all about finance. Now if you have followed uh, previous COPs, previous climate change conferences, finance always is on the agenda. It's one of the most important things on the climate agenda at every COP. So why is finance important? Because you need money for all sorts of climate action, Correct. right? So any sort of climate action requires huge of, uh, amounts of money and we are talking in terms of trillions of dollars, mm. not just billions of dollars, but trillions of dollars. Right. Now, all climate conversations actually have their origin, they go back to 1992, yes. right? Uh, there was an Earth Summit, very famous uh, Rio de Janeiro conference, conference, out of which there were three agreements that came out. We'll forget about the other two right now. And one of them was this climate change agreement, which oh. is called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Right? That was the first acknowledgement way back in 1992 that climate change was being caused by human intervention and that we need to do something to fix climate change right now why is that document important because that uh, un framework convention that did two things that that did lots of other things but for our consumption right now that did two things one it put the responsibility of climate action on a certain group of countries now those group of countries were supposed to have historical responsibility over the last 100, 150 years. These were the group of countries that have caused the maximum emissions and therefore the responsibility was put mainly on them. The responsibility was global, everyone had to take action, but mainly on these set of rich and industrialized rich. countries who were supposed to cut their emissions. Correct. 
and the same set of countries, roughly the same set of countries, although there are differences and we will not go into the details of those, but roughly the same set of countries were also supposed to provide finance, make, uh, help financially the developing countries to take action, right? right. So developing countries had uh, limited responsibility and they were also supposed to be helped financially, also technologically. So both finance and technology were supposed to flow from a certain group of countries which were identified to the developing world, right? So both these things had happened. Emission cuts would happen in uh, primarily in these countries and also they were held responsible for providing finance and technology, right? So, so the, the question of finance comes from there, yeah. right? Now what has happened is, of, so these group of countries are mandated to provide money to developing countries to help them fight climate change. Now what is the amount of money that, mm. that has to come, right? So that was never discussed uh, and that was never uh, you know, uh, finalized till 2009, wherein the then US Secretary of State at the Copenhagen conference made an offer that from 2020 onwards, the developed countries would provide at least $100 billion every year to the developing countries. And that's the origin of the $100 billion figure, right. which is quite common in every, you know, it keeps up uh, coming up in all sorts of discussions. So from Correct. 2020 onwards, the developed countries are under an obligation to provide at least $100 billion every year to the developing countries as okay. climate finance. We are now in 2024. Now, what happened was in 2015 in Paris Agreement, uh -huh. uh, when the Paris Agreement was done, it was one of the provisions in Paris Agreement is that $100 billion is a small sum of money considering the kind of requirement yeah. and that 2025 onwards, post 2025, <laughs> this needs to be scaled up. So whatever figure would be decided would be provided minimum from 20, 2026 onwards, right? So that was there in Paris Agreement. This is 2024. Yeah. Next year, is the last year for the $100 billion figure. And from 2026 onwards, people have to agree to a new... F so this is what is going to be decided in uh, Baku. What should be the replacement for $100 billion? And there have been suggestions, the requirements are in trillions of dollars. And the suggestions that have been made right now are all in the range of about uh, 1 to 1.5 billion dollars, uh, sorry, 1 to 1.5 trillion dollars every year flowing from the developed countries to the developing countries. So that's one big thing. There are other elements of the finance agreement, but this is the context in which we are going to go, uh, Baku. That's a tough uh, deadline, I think. Yes. We are chasing. Uh, but apart from that, there have been numerous pledges uh, right. in trying to cut down emissions um, as mandated by the Paris Agreement. So how do you see COP29 trying to bridge the gap sort of in terms of making these pledges and then actually reducing emissions? Uh, how do you see it? So every COP actually asks the countries yeah. to scale up their ambition of their climate action which effectively means that please do more for climate action, uh, please cut your emissions even more, that, those kind of things. Uh, so this particular COP, uh, COP29, uh, is not overtly concerned with emissions. Mm -hmm. Next year will be because 2025 is the deadline uh, for, you know, uh, for all the countries to scale up. So every country has to submit its climate action plans in writing. Right, it's called in climate jargon. It's called NDC. You know, so uh, nationally determined contributions. But effectively, what it means is every country has to submit a climate action plan, and then uh, so these are promises that we will be doing these, these, these kind one, two, three kind of actions, and these have to be uh, submitted periodically every five years. So next year, every country has to do that, right. and there is also a mandate that every subsequent NDC every subsequent uh, climate action has to be stronger and more ambitious than the previous one. So countries have submitted uh, NDCs or climate action plans in 2020. The next round 
is going to happen in 2025. So next year's COP uh, will be big on emission reductions. Right. This year's COP uh, is majorly concerned with you know, uh, mobilizing finance. So uh, we'll see a lot of uh, talk on finance this time. Next year, there'll be huge talks about increasing the ambition of climate action. Uh, of course, Amitabh, before I let you go, this year has been a year of unprecedented natural disasters. Dubai faced unprecedented rainfall in the middle of April. India faced uh, such a triggering heat wave. How do you see the role of, uh, you know, adaptation and resilience being played out at COP29? Right. So, uh, this year is not special. Going forward, every year probably you will see unprecedented kind of impacts happening uh, and far greater uh, kind of impacts, climate impacts happening. So this is this is just the beginning. This is uh, happening as was being predicted. Now, there is a school of thought uh, and now, at least in the developing countries, uh, that's a major concern, uh, which says we need to pay uh, equal, if not greater attention on adaptation uh, while you know, trying to reduce emission reductions as well, uh, re reduce emissions as well. So, emission reductions uh, commonly are described as mitigation and then you have adaptation when we are trying to uh, adapt to whatever is coming at you. So, uh, till now, most of the climate actions, at least the talk is mainly about mitigation actions, how to reduce emission uh, emissions from all the countries so that we meet climate objectives but especially the developing countries uh, and small island states uh, least developed countries they have been quite vocal right from the very start saying you have to at least uh, pay equal attention and when we say equal attention it also means in, in terms of availability of money availability of technology uh, on adaptation projects as well because they they argue that they would be the worst affected. Uh, small island states, they, they face existential threats. You know, some of the islands might just disappear because right. of rising sea levels. So their argument is while you do mitigation and everything, you also have to pay attention to adaptation. And now this is a growing demand. And we have seen in the last few uh, COPs uh, that adaptation, uh, the demands for adaptation have grown. Now the finance uh, agreement, as I said, it will have several other elements apart from just the increase of 100 billion dollars to some trillion figure. It w one of those elements would also be increasing the share of climate money going into adaptation. So uh, the demand is for at least 50-50, uh, but we don't know what uh, will come out. But it will certainly be one of the elements of the final outcome from Baku, the equal attention on adaptation. Absolutely. So the final outcome uh, from Baku at the COP29, we'll be covering for you. We'll be bringing you highlights and updates from the COP29 summit at Baku. And uh, thank you for watching us. Amitabh, thank you for joining us thank for you. all the live updates on recent news, breaking news and explainer pieces on climate change and environment. Visit our official YouTube channel of the Indian Express. Thank you for watching.